Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this complete CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. In this lecture, you'll learn about connected, local, and static routes for IPv6. IPv6 routing works pretty much exactly the same way as it does for IPv4. But IPv4 routing and IPv6 routing are separate processes and they each have their own separate routing table. So if a router receives an IPv4 packet, meaning it's got an IPv4 address as the destination, it will route it according to its IPv4 routing table. And if that same router receives an IPv6 packet, it will get routed according to its IPv6 routing table. Now, obviously, for a router to be able to route IPv6 traffic, it needs to have IPv6 enabled. So it needs to have IPv6 unicast routing, it needs to have its own IPv6 addresses, and it needs to have the IPv6 routes in its routing table. The IPv4 and IPv6 routing tables are built in exactly the same way through static routes or via dynamic routing protocols like RIP, EIGRP, and OSPF. All of those dynamic routing protocols support both IPv4 and IPv6 as well. IPv4 routing is enabled by default on a Cisco iOS router, but IPv6 routing is not, so you have to turn it on. The way that you do turn it on is with the command IPv6 unicast routing. Now, if you forget to put that command on there, you can still configure IPv6 addresses on the router's interfaces and it will be able to communicate with hosts that are on those same subnets. But if a host tries to send IPv6 traffic through the router, the router won't forward it. So this can be confusing because the host will be able to ping the router. The router might be able to ping what's ever on the other side. But if you don't have IPv6 unicast routing enabled, the router is not going to forward the traffic. So whenever you're configuring IPv6 on a router, that should be the first command that you put in. The connected and local routes, just like everything else, work the same way in IPv6 as they do in IPv4. So you see in the example configuration here, we've got a dual stack router, meaning that it's running IPv4 and IPv6 at the same time. You don't need to do that if you're running IPv6. So you could have a router with IPv4 only, or you could have a router with IPv6 only, or you can have a router running both IPv4 and IPv6. When you do that, it's called a dual stack router. So the way we can do that is like you see in the example here on interface fast ethernet zero slash zero, we've configured an IPv4 address, that's IP address 10.10.1.1. And we've also configured an IPv6 address on that interface 2001db8011, which is the standard slash 64. And we've also configured an IPv4 and an IPv6 address on fast ethernet two slash zero. As usual, when we are configuring IPv4, the command starts with just IP, like IP address. When we're configuring IPv6, it starts with IPv6, like IPv6 address. So we've got those IP addresses configured on the interfaces. When you do that, it will automatically enter a connected and a local route for those interfaces into the routing table. So what I'm going to do in this section is we'll look at IPv4 first as a refresher, and then we'll compare that with how things will look with IPv6. So we've configured our interfaces with IPv4 and IPv6. We then do a show IP route, and that will show us the IPv4 routing table. And you can see we've got entries that match the interfaces we just configured. I have a connected route for 10.10.0.0 slash 24, 
out interface fast 2 slash 0 and a connected route for 10.10.1.0 slash 24 out interface fast 0 slash 0. From iOS 15, the router will also add local routes as well. Local routes always have a slash 32 mask. So I can see 10.10.0.1 slash 32 on fast 2 slash 0 and 10.10.1.1 slash 32 on fast 0 slash 0. The reason we can see both connected and local routes, the reason that this was added is that it allows us to see the full configuration on the interface from a show IP route command. I can see the connected route is 10.10.0.0 slash 24, and the matching local route is 10.10.0.1 slash 32. So I know that the IP address on the interface is 10.10.0.1 slash 24. Okay, so that was for IPv4. The same example to see the IPv6 routing table is of course show IPv6 route. And we'll have similar entries in here as well. So I've got my two connected routes, which match the IPv6 addresses that I added, and my two local routes as well. IPv6 uses a 128-bit address, so the local routes will show up as slash 128. So I've got my connected route for 2001 DB8, double colon slash 64 on fast Ethernet 2 slash 0. And my other connected route, 2001 DB801, double colon slash 64, is on fast 0 slash 0. And I can see my slash 128 local routes there as well. If a router receives traffic for a network which it is not directly attached to, it needs to know how to get there in order to forward the traffic. So like you just saw, whenever we configure an IP address on the interface, the router is directly attached to those networks and those routes will be automatically added into the routing table. But if it wants to get to a network that it is not directly attached to, it needs to know how to get there. So as an administrator, you can manually do that by adding a static route to that destination, or the router can learn it via a routing protocol like RIP, OSPF, EIGRP, BGP, and ISIS. So let's have a look at an example of adding static routes. I've got R2 on the left, which is connected to the 10.1.0 24 and the 10.0.0 slash 24 networks. So it doesn't need routes added for them, but the 10.0.1.0 24 and the 10.0.2.0 24 networks are behind R1. So R2 is gonna need to have routes added to get to those networks behind R1. Similarly, R1 will need to have a route added to get to the 10.1.0.0 slash 24 network, which is behind R2. So I add the routes on R1. I've got IP route 10.1.0.0, 255.255.255.0 .255 for the subnet mask. And the next hop address is 10.0.0.2, which is the interface that is on R2 that R1 can reach directly. Then for my routes going back in the other direction, I'm going to have IP routes for 10.0.1.0 and 10.0.2.0, both with a 24-bit mask on R2, where the next hop is R1 at 10.0.0.1. So you knew that already. That's how we do it in IPv4. For IPv6, obviously, it's going to be very similar. So here on R1, we need to add a route to the 2001 DB8.0.0 network, which is behind R2. So in IPv4, it's IP route. In IPv6, we say IPv6 route. So we've got IPv6 route, 2001 colon DB8. And I don't need to put in the zero and zero because remember for when we've got a contiguous bank of zeros, we can just say colon colon there. So we say 2001 colon db8 colon colon, meaning that all the rest of the fields are a zero slash 64. And then the next hop address is R2 at 2001 db8 zero one double colon two. So that's the route on R1 to get to the network behind R2. I'm also gonna need a couple of routes on R2 to get to the networks behind R1. So I say IPv6 route on R2, 2001 db8 02 and another route for 2001 db8 03 slash 64 and the next hop address is r1 at 2001 db8 
0, 1, double, colon, 1. Okay, so that's how we add our static routes. Just like with IPv4, we can also do summary and default routes in IPv6 as well. Looking at how we do it in IPv4 first, so the routes here are on R1. I've got a summary route here up at the top. So you see the networks beginning with 10.1. I've got 10.1.1 is between R4 and R3, and 10.1.0 is between R3 and R2. R1 is not directly connected to those networks, so it's going to need a route to get there. I could do that by adding two separate routes. I could have a route for 10.1.0.0 slash 24, and another route for 10.1.1.0 slash 24, but I can summarize that to 10.1.0.0 slash 16, and then that will encompass both networks. So I can do it by just adding one route rather than adding multiple routes. So my command there is IP route 10.1.0.0, 255.255.0.0, and the next hop address is on R2 at 10.0.0.2. I also need a normal route for IP route 10.1.3.0, which is between R4 and R5. I use a 24-bit mask there, 255.255.255.0, and the next hop address is R5 at 10.0.3.2. Then we'll say that R1 is also connected out to the internet, so I want a default static route for all traffic that's not on the inside is going to go out to the internet. The command for that is IP route 0.0.0.0, 0.0.0.0 means it's a default static route. And the next hop address in this example is 203.0.113.2. That is the router out at our service provider. So that's how we do it in IPv4. It's similar scenario for IPv6. So here, I'm going to do my summary route first. So you see all the networks beginning with 2001 DB80 are available along the top path through R2. So that will cover my network between R3 and R4 and my network between R2 and R3. Rather than adding separate slash 64 routes for DB8 for 2001 DB801 and 2001 db802 i can add a slash 48 route for everything beginning with 2001 db80 so i say ipv6 route 2001 db80 double colon slash 48 so that's going to cover everything beginning with 2001 db80 and the next hop address is 2001 db80 double colon 2 which is on r2 I also need a route for the network between R4 and R5. So I say IPv6 route 2001 DB811 double colon slash 64. So this is not a summary route. The next hop address is R5 at 2001 DB811 double colon 2. And I'm also going to add a default static route here as well. So to do that in IPv6, it's IPv6 route double colon slash zero. That is the equivalent of oda 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 o, oda 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 o in IPv4. And the next hop address is at my service provider. That's 2001 db83 double colon two. Okay, so that was our connected routes, our local routes, static routes, summary routes, and a default static route for IPv6. Next up, we're going to take a look at how to actually configure this with a lab example. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad free right now, then you can enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp by clicking the link above my head or in the description. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.